Hello traders, my name is Adam Himes, I'm the CEO of AlphaChain and welcome to the first part of your cryptocurrency on-chain series. Perhaps the most dominant form of analysis in cryptocurrency trading is the study of price action. That's technical analysis, which you will cover in other parts of this program. However, within the cryptocurrency market, we have a new and emerging area of data analysis available to us, known as on-chain analysis. Here we are able to use the information provided by public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which provide a unique perspective on the state of the market at that time that can complement our other analysis very well. And this is not possible in other traditional asset classes. So what are we going to cover in this series? We'll start with describing what is on-chain analysis. So we'll look at some examples to really show you what it is. And then we'll move on to how can we actually use it in our trading? Why is it useful to us? And how can we ultimately use it? We'll then move on to what indicators there are. So we'll cover a few indicators. There's a huge number of these indicators provided by different data providers out there. And we'll cover some of probably the more, the more interesting ones uh, through this course. Then we'll move on to how to build a macro model with Python. So how to combine some of these indicators together to give us a real picture of what's going on in the market at the time. At the time. And then we'll end it with considerations when trading. So how can we make use of this model and how might we read it when we're trading? Okay, so to begin, what is on-chain analysis? So a crypto assets public blockchain ledger provides data on its economic activity. So we can actually look into the blockchain. There's many freely available websites where we can do that. For example, on, on uh, the Ethereum blockchain, we can use Etherscan. That's a very well-known Ethereum-based blockchain scanner where we can look directly into transactions on the blockchain. But data providers provide us with clean data where we can actually look at independent parts of the data on chain. For example, we can look at number of sending or receiving addresses at any one time, if we choose our given time frame. We can look at number of active addresses, total fees paid, minor activity, and lots more other data points, which are nicely cleaned by the data providers for us, and then we can do our own analysis on them. The good thing about on-chain data is that it's incorruptible, immutable, and easily accessible. So the data on chain will not be revised, cannot be edited um, back in time. Whatever is on the chain will be there forever and it cannot be changed. So this is data that we can trust, that this is exactly what happened in the past and there's no risk of it being changed by anyone coming in at a later point in time. This analysis of the on-chain metrics allows us to measure sentiment, activity of investors and also their behavior. So that's the idea on what we're, why we're using this data or how we're going to use it. We want to engage sentiment and see what's actually going on. What are investors doing on the, block, on the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain? And what can we infer about that with regards to price or our trading activity? It is a fundamentals driven approach. So throughout this program, um, you've been covering things about technical analysis, you know, how to read price, other indicators that you can use that are all linked to price. But this gives us a new way of analyzing the market from a more fundamental driven approach as opposed to a technical approach. And finally, we are able to focus on a single asset as a market proxy. So for example, in my model that I use, I use it mainly based on BTC, which I use as a market proxy. Generally, the market is very correlated at, at, this, at this moment. It may not be in the future, but currently the, the correlations are relatively high. Or we can compare different crypto assets to understand or identify any areas of undervalued assets or overvalued assets. So some of these data providers give us on-chain metrics for other chains, Ethereum and other chains as well. And, you know, it really depends on how you want to use this data, but there's lots of different ways you can use it. Okay, so this is just an example of one particular metric that I got from CryptoQuant. So CryptoQuant is one of the data providers that I use who go to the chain, they clean the data and they chart it for us, right? And then we can pull that data and, and do, do it with it as we wish. So this is showing active addresses on the Ethereum blockchain over time from January 16 all the way to Jan 22. So the blue line is F active addresses, right? So how many addresses are active at any one time? 
Now, CryptoQuant has their own way of of um, of really categorizing an active address. And if you go onto their website, they'll categorize that for you. So you have a good understanding of what is what is an active address. How did they define that? But this this metric you can see is quite noisy, right? There's lots of noise in the data. There's lots of up and down moves. And you know what we might do over time is learn to clean the data. So we might add our own indicators on top of it, such as a moving average to try and clean it. Or we might do multiple indicators on it to try and give us signals. But this is just a raw data I wanted to show you and compare it versus price, which you can see is a black line underneath the Ethereum price over time. So the idea here is that this data is showing the total number of unique active addresses, that's important, they're unique, inclusive of senders and receivers. So how you might use this is this could be a good gauge of network demand, right? For example, as active addresses increases, you may assume that new users are entering the space and opening up new wallets. When number of act active addresses rises sharply, this usually correlates with a rising price, right? So we can see that over here. When we see a sharp rise in active addresses, we then see a sharp move in price. As you can see, the data is noisy, so you know we, we might want to smooth it. But this shows you how you know some of these indicators can really correlate well with price. And then what we want to do um, with the data is see whether it's a leading in indicator, a lagging indicator, or how we can actually use this to infer trading decisions or build some kind of macro model to aid our trading decisions. Okay, so this is another indicator called net unrealized profit and loss, and this is on Bitcoin. So in the background, in you can see um, the candles, the green and red candles of Bitcoin over time. This is a log price chart. So this is a log of price of Bitcoin over time. And I use a log because it just, it just looks better on a chart. It's easier to analyze because when you have that exponential growth, it's very hard to see the normal price growth over time on a single chart without it looking a bit odd. So I always tend to lose, lose, use log here. So NUPL or net unrealized profit and loss is a difference between the market cap of the asset, so Bitcoin, and the realized cap. So we'll go into some of those um, definitions later on, this particularly realized cap. And then we divide those two by market cap. As I said, we'll go into some of the details later on on how we define these different indicators and how they're calculated. But the idea here is just to see how it looks when you plot it versus price. Right, so you can see price in the background at the log of price over time, and you can see the indicator NUPL in, in red. So what I've also done is plotted two areas of interest on this chart. You can see them up here. I think one's around 0.7, the others are around 0, minus 0 0.3. And the idea is when you see this indicator exceed a certain level, perhaps that's an indication that things are overbought, right? And you can see that correlates quite nicely with price up here. And then on the flip side, you can see when it's below the other threshold I've set, actually that would have been a pretty good time to buy, right? Or close your shorts. And you can see that correlates quite now, nice with this sell-off here. So this is just another example of a different type of data that we can get from some of these data providers and how when you plot them with price, they look quite interesting. And we can hopefully infer areas of um, undervalued or overpriced assets using these tools. So why should we use on-chain analysis? What, what's the point? You know, what value does it add? So as we mentioned before, it helps us to gauge investor behavior and the health of the network in real time. So unlike in equity markets, right, where you have your quarterly reports, you don't know what's going on really with the business in between those quarterly reports. Yes, you can go online and look at social media and, and people talking about certain products to see if sales are increasing, but you don't really understand what's going on with the revenue of the business or the earnings uh, in real time. You have to wait for those quarterly periods. That's very different to crypto, right? With on-chain analysis, we can look at exactly what's going on at a given moment in time or whatever time period we choose, you know, hourly, daily, weekly, whatever we want. And that gives us a bit of an edge because we can see actively if fees are going up on the Ethereum blockchain, if more people are paying, paying fees, if less people are paying fees, if less wallets are being opened, if more wallets are being opened, that gives us some indication on the health of the market and ultimately what might be happen with, happening with price. With, with the second point, you know, analyzing activity on chain can provide cryptocurrency traders as an edge. And this is exactly why we put this in this program, right? Using this really can provide you with an edge. When you use it in collaboration with your 
underlying trading strategy, right? So on-chain analysis sh shouldn't really be used um, as your pure trading signal, okay? It can be quite noisy. They're generally not as good on smaller time frames, so they're far more effective on higher time frames, so like daily, weekly, monthly, mainly because the data is so noisy, right? We want to see those trends over time, the growth in the network or the, or the changing themes in, in how the, the network is growing over time. But it can be used very well to gauge market tops or market bottoms when using with a robust trading strategy, right? So for how you might use that, for example, is if you identify that we're currently in an area which is overbought or which could potentially be a market top according to your macro model, you might want to ensure that you're no longer placing long trades within your core strategy, or you might want to trim your longs, or you might want to look for potential short setups Right, so there's ways we can use this model to help our underlying strategy and gives us a bit more of that edge that actually people not understanding on-chain analysis or even using any of this data wouldn't know. And the goal here really is to combine multiple on-chain indicators to build a total macro model of the crypto ecosystem. So any one indicator in its own doesn't give us much information. Some of the data can be noisy, some of it can be unreliable. So what we want to do is we want to combine multiple different data points, different indicators to help us build a more a better picture that we can have more confidence in. You know, if multiple indicators are showing us that perhaps we're in an overbought territory, then we can have more confidence than if one indicator is telling us that. That's the idea. So here is just an example of a simple model I've built with multiple different indicators on there. I think I've used around six or seven indicators, all purely on chain indicators here, to really help me gauge when we might be at the top of a market cycle or at the bottom of a market cycle. Um, I've also, with each of the indicators, I've had to define the parameter values or thresholds, which I believe are interesting in each of those data points. These are areas which I believe might help me understand if we're overbought or oversold. Near a market top, for example, as I mentioned, I might not want to open any longs and at a market bottom, I might not want to enter any market shorts. So you can see I've highlighted areas here based on the indicator of the signals that I get from the macro model as areas of interest. Green are areas of buying interest, right? And we can see that this is all purely based on on-chain indicators. It's not based on price, but it correlates very well with market bottoms, right? We can see back here in 2015-16, these would be good areas to buy from, from a long-term perspective. And areas in red, we can see here, would have been good areas to sell. And again, this is all through a combination of on-chain indicators to help us understand these areas of interest. Um, and this is the goal, really, to build something like this that will help us gauge a, a macro picture on what's happening in the, in the total cycle on, on the cryptocurrency markets. So what are some of the issues when using this data? <clears throat> so like any data point or, or data source, there are there can be issues and you need to be aware of them to ensure that you'll be able to use them properly, right? If you're blind to any issues, then you're you're open to, to use the data incorrectly and hopefully get, well, maybe get wrong findings from the data. So number one, as I've mentioned, is the data is noisy, right? As you saw from number of addresses or number of active addresses, it can be super volatile. So sometimes you need to apply some normalization or some kind of mean meaning on top of it. So to move to add an average, a moving average on top of it, something like that to clean the data and make it easier to use. As I mentioned earlier, single on-chain indicator can be quite unreliable, right? So the idea is to combine multiple different indicators to give us that macro picture on what's going on. Very more data points can, can give us more confidence than a single data point. And there is data from these data providers which looks at exchanges. So for example, um, number of Bitcoin going into an exchange in one period, a number of Bitcoin leaving an exchange in any one period. Now for this data to be accurate, the data providers need to ensure that they're constantly updating the wallets of these exchanges. Now, exchanges often change their wallets quite regularly. I think it's more of a security thing why they do that. And that means these data providers need to ensure they're always keeping up to date with the wallet. So as you can understand, that's a pretty difficult job. Some of the data providers are pretty good at that at the moment, but it's just something to be aware of that some of the 
exchange data might not be 100% accurate. And I think sometimes what they'll do is they'll retrospectively update that data. So from my analysis, I tend to not use exchange data, but I do know many people use it and can use it very well. So you know, I don't think you need to avoid it. You just want to be aware that if you are using it, that very recent data might be updated in a day or two when when new data on exchange addresses for um, new exchange wallets is, are released. So I've alluded to it a few times, you know, our main goal here is to build that macro cryptocurrency model using multiple on-chain indicators to build that picture of the current state of the market. The model will allow us to assess where we are currently in the in the current market cycle to aid our trading decisions. I think we've made that clear now. OK, well, that was just the introduction into the phase one of the program. Um, I'll see you in phase two.